Okay, we are ready to begin. You are now in for a treat. Um, you're going to learn about m things most people who would claim to be EMP experts and are not do not know much about. You're going to hear about EMP myths and their solutions. So if you could take a seat. Um, I was at a congressional hearing or meeting um, on Capitol Hill, a, oh, I don't know, three, four, five years back. We're about ready to begin, so countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, swap the business cards, talk twice as fast out of both sides of your mouth, get all, you know, four times the information out. Ready? Oh, boy, that worked. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I was at a, a meeting with uh, some high-level folks, and I certainly wasn't one of them. Uh, and I was in the room, and Dr. William Graham, who's, you know, heads the MP commission, was walking out, and he didn't know me from Adam. And so I had like five seconds to talk with him, and I said to him, I'm working on some civilian protection issues with EMP and so on. If I wanted the best guy in the world, who would I go get a hold of? And he just told me, you got to get a hold of my, the next speaker. Uh, because he used to run these programs, you know, when he, he was running, you know, these programs in the, in the country. And he said, and he's, and he's in Virginia. He told me the smallest bit of information about him, but it was just barely enough I could hunt him down. And now I've gotten to know Dr. George Baker. He used to run a lot of, among other things, running a lot of the programs for the U.S. government, anything to do with uh, EMP pretty much. So he understands the technology, the procurement issues, you know, where things stand. He, he can't even say it. Uh, carefully enough, um, some of the major standards on EMP are things that he either developed uh, primarily uh, on his own or with other people's help. So he has had a hand in most of this over many years. I would hope he could take a moment just to tell us how that all got started and then go right into his uh, next presentation on some common misperceptions about EMP, Dr. George Baker. Thanks very much. and. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased with uh, the turnout today and, and appreciate each one of you being here. Well, Chuck uh, called me uh, uh, and mentioned that he was having a, his a second uh, DuPont uh, conference and uh, asked me if I'd li like to speak. And I said, well, I, I don't know. Do you, what, what do you think? And he said, yeah, you, you, can, you can talk. And uh, I, I uh, was trying to think, what could I could I, what kind of information that I, could I bring that would be the most helpful? And the thought occurred to me that there are certain um, erroneous conceptions about EMP that I hear over and over and over again and have for many years, uh, not, not just at the working level but at the policy level, and misconceptions that uh, um, at their worst or at their best are, are causing people to do the wrong thing in order to uh, be prepared and at the worst, uh, causing people to not to take action uh, when action is, is possible and affordable. And uh, So what I'm going to do, and, and this is not an exhaustive list. In the 15 minutes I have, I'm going to try to cover seven of what I believe are the, uh, if not important, they may, they may be the most important to misperceptions. And I hope that, that this will have some uh, effect and an encouraging effect on our uh, efforts to, uh, to uh, uh, protect ourselves and, be, and to be prepared. Uh, some of the uh, effects, uh, the misperceptions, uh, fall into the uh, category of hyperbole, and uh, others just the opposite, uh, misperceptions that tend to uh, uh, re reduce or eliminate the threat in, in, incorrectly. And so what I'm going to try to do is draw a happy medium here. All right, so uh, if I can figure out how to use this is an Apple computer, and I'm definitely not an Apple person. Okay, so here are the seven, and uh, you can read those. And I'm going to, I have a, let's see if this, I have a, a, a chart on each one of these. Uh, first is that you need really big weapons to have an effect, uh, so that we really need, only need to worry about an attack from uh, the former Soviet Union or China, that, that incorrect. Uh, that it will burn out every exposed electronic system. I'll explain why that's not correct. Uh, that the effects will be very limited. I hear this a lot in policy circles, that the effects will be limited to sort of nuisance-type upset effects, also incorrect. 
um, that the, the costs are prohibitive, that, that is a gross exaggeration, um, that E1 is not really a concern with reference to power grid, uh, the, you know, the prompt part of the EMP is not a concern. Uh, only, we don't need to worry about the late time geomagnetic disturbances or magnetohydrodynamic effects, incorrect. Uh, the fiber, op fiber, fiber optic lines are by their design invulnerable to EMP, not correct. And that ground burst EMP effects are really not something we need to worry about because they're dwarfed by uh, the hard kill blast thermal radiation effects, not correct. Okay, first uh, misconception, and here I think I'm going to need this laser pointer. Um, uh, it turns out that low-yield weapons, and I'm talking about weapons uh, in the 10, 10 kiloton range, if they are detonated at low altitudes, something around uh, 60 to 70, 75 kilometers, you'll notice that the, uh, the peak EMP field on the ground is really in the same range as megaton class weapons. Uh, they all produce tens of thousands of volts per meter. Now it is true that for the high yield weapons that uh, you can raise the height of burst much higher and get big uh, uh, fields in the ground. With the low yield weapons, you have to have them pretty close to the ground. But recognize that at 60 kilometers, which is the optimum height of burst for a 10 kiloton weapon, the radius out to the horizon is 500 miles. So the diameter of the effect is 1,000 miles from a 25, uh, 10, 10, 25, 30 uh, a kiloton burst. And the other uh, little uh, monograph I have here is the peak field on the ground in, in kV per meter and the... Uh, uh, maximum short circuit current, which ra ranges in the thousands of amps, and the maximum open circuit voltage that you would get on an overhead line or a ground right on the surface. Uh, again, even with the low yield weapons, you're getting uh, 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 voltages approaching a megavolt on overhead lines. Okay. Second misconception that uh, the effects uh, be very, will be very limited. Um, it turns out EMP uh, uh, doesn't affect every system, but uh, even if you have widespread failure over this thousand kilometer diameter uh, uh, effects on, li on limited numbers of systems, because of their interconnectivity, uh, that uh, you'll, you can still have a very large-scale cascading failures of the infrastructure. And Paul Erdos, uh, there's a network theory that's been developed that based on the average number of nodes or, or connections per node, uh, so if you're sitting next to someone, you hold your hand, that's one connection. If you hold the, the hand of the guy, other, the guy on the other side of you, that's two connections. Well, if, you, if, if the two connections apply, the fraction of the network that's interconnected on average goes up to about 50 percent. So the, the point is that because of interconnectivity, even if only just a few nodes fail, because of the uh, you know, uh, large interconnectivity on a lot of our networks, uh, you're going to bring down large portions of, of the networks. Okay. And for many systems, especially unmanned systems, upset, you know, people say, you know, you're just, just going to get upset effects. Upset effects are the same as a permanent, a permanent irreversible effect. Um, if you lock up long-haul uh, communication repeaters, lots of them, and you know, these are unmanned, it's going to take lots of technicians to go out and reset or replace those. Uh, upset of uh, pipeline uh, control, supervisory control systems, same. Uh, generator controls. We, we had a, a demonstration, uh, uh, the Aurora demonstration project uh, showed that you could actually cause generator machinery to self-destruct if you, if you played with the uh, timing on the, on the uh, generator controls. And then uh, the, if you upset machine process controllers in manufacturing plants, you get similar uh, self-destruction uh, of the equipment. So, so upset oftentimes can, can result in uh, irreversible uh, uh, or difficult to reset uh, effects. Um, protection of our uh, critical nat national 
uh, national infrastructure would cost you a, lar a large amount. Well, there's been a lot of recent, just over the last year or so, of uh, cost studies um, and, uh, and risk studies, and we, we find that uh, of the 14 critical infrastructure sectors, I'm not, call I'm not counting key assets in this list, uh, that EMP risk is highest for long, long line systems, the electric power grid and telecommunications grid. So if we focused our attention on those particular infrastructures, those two infrastructures, uh, uh, there would be a, a very big benefit uh, and also a big, big uh, cost savings. Uh, electric power grid alone, in fact, I would argue that if we pre protected only the electric power grid, that would be uh, in and of itself worth doing just by itself. Uh, because of the bipolar nature of the failure, it fails fast and hard over very large regions, and it's most uh, necessary, as we've heard today in many, many of the talks, for sustaining uh, life uh, of the civilian populace. And then uh, if we protect the components most difficult to replace, that buys very valuable time. So if we were to protect the transformers, these, these very large transformers, uh, that, that would be w worth in itself. So I'm sort of whittling the problem down to something that I think is very uh, uh, manageable from, from a uh, cost and, and uh, feasibility standpoint. Um, we, the high voltage transformer protection unit cost estimates have come, come in something around a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, uh, and uh, we're actually also finding that you, you don't have to protect every transformer. You can protect uh, multiple transformers with these uh, uh, devices. Single, single ones of these devices. And if there's something in the order of three, 300 to 3,000 of these, uh, uh, you're, you're talking about costs in the, in the single digit billions of dollars. Uh, SCADA system protection, uh, the, uh, obviously SCADA systems will be vulnerable to E1, but the, there uh, the, the, you have availability of replacement parts, unlike the, the big transformers, and they're relatively easy to repair. Uh, the protection of costs for the heavy-duty uh, uh, grid components, there's been uh, some amortization studies, and it would, it would raise uh, our, our individual utility rates with pennies per month, so not, not a big expense. Um, there's a misconception that only late time, the EMP, E3, and not the prompt EMP will damage the uh, transformers, these major grid components. There's very, been very little test data. The only test data I could find was, is it was an Oak Ridge study of 20 uh, distribution, 7.2 kilovolt distribution transformers. And uh, we, the E1, they, they uh, injected a E1-like uh, current into these transformers and found that uh, there, were, there, were, uh, there was permanent damage due to uh, Turn to turn flashover and primary to secondary flashover, and there's a you can't it's, it's an eye chart, but there's the data is there. And, and Chuck, we will have these charts available for people. Okay. Um, we also a good news side that the, the, the transformers they tested with direct mounted lightning surge arresters uh, were not damaged. So the message there is it, it may be that uh, in cases where you have a lightning protection on the transformer, lightning protection will suffice against the prompt uh, EMP. Now we need similar tests. This has been alluded to earlier in the day, but we need similar tests of, uh, of the uh, high voltage uh, transformers. Uh, optical fiber networks are vulnerable to EMP, and that's because the line drivers, the the line drivers, uh, you know, the conversion units are, uh, turn out to be uh, vulnerable to E1. And that uh, the long haul uh, uh, telecom and internet optical fiber uh, cables have repeaters. The undersea cables have uh, a DC line that runs the length of the, under, of the uh, submarine cable. And uh, those that will pick up the E3 and solar storm effects and, and possibly burn out the amplifiers on our undersea cables. And then for the uh, terrestrial lines, uh, the repeaters are fed off the commercial grid. So uh, those, uh, these lines are, are uh, vulnerable. We, we uh, could very well lose the internet uh, in an EMP environment or solar storm environment. Uh, on the plus side, the, uh, the line drivers, receivers, and the repeaters are relatively easy to protect uh, uh, with uh, you know, just well-known engineering treatments. 
And finally, I think this is my last one. Uh, ground burst EMP effects are limited to two to five kilometers. I've seen several studies that really uh, of uh, EMP effects from a ground burst in a, in a city that, that really dismiss any kind of uh, EMP effect. Uh, and uh, they're look, the studies look at only, only at the fields that are radiated away from the uh, burst. They don't look at the, field, the, uh, the currents coupled onto lines that go through the, uh, the uh, source region. And so uh, it turns out that ground bursts do couple very large currents to long lines that run through the, the source region. The source region is the ionized region around the burst that extends roughly two to four kilometers away from the burst. And uh, uh, you can have destructive source region EMP effects on power and lo long power and communication uh, lines, uh, systems connected to those lines and that extend significantly beyond the blast thermal and radiation region. I've got a plot of a 10 kiloton, uh, the, the current on a 10 kiloton, uh, uh, 20, 20 kilometers down the line that goes through the source region of a 10 kiloton uh, burst. And you notice that the, the field hangs up around... Uh, of uh, 2,000 amps, amp, but it, it, it lasts for multiple uh, milliseconds. So it's a long, it's a, it's a long pulse. It's not, yeah, so that, that long pulse is due to the neutron effect, and then there's a short pulse associated with the gamma, the gamma uh, fields. But the, these, these currents persist to tens of kilometers from the burst. For a megaton class burst, uh, you're, uh, you're going to have, at, at, the, at 20 kilometers, you will have... Uh, uh, 150,000 amps of so that, that order at 20 kilometers. And so uh, for larger yield uh, bursts, you know, you're talking you know, things that may you know, propagate even beyond the city. The, uh, the city. Uh, again, there's, there's more study that is required here, but you're not talking about something that's just going to be limited to a couple of kilometers. You're talking about the EMP effects that could take out the power grid and long, haul, long, long line grid over a city or, or even larger regions. So that's my, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the message, and uh, I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Sure, I see, do I see hands? Uh, while we're getting one, if, if out of all the others, um, while others are going to be, uh, here comes someone, um, while he's walking down, tell us what the number eight would be. <laughs> is, that, is there another one that you'd want to come up with just off the top of your head while he's coming down the front? Um, Going, going, almost gone. Well, one of the yeah, one of the things uh, I, I really don't want to get into it because it's yeah. technical. But uh, there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the uh, high altitude burst effects on satellites. Okay, very good. Here's a, here's a question. Um, repeated mention of a cer certain numbers of amps and volts generated in metal from these EMPs. Um, I'm having a difficult time translating that into what I would see. Um, how that translates to, you know, what you what you would what an individual would see is this part one is that this voltage is because a long line is exposed. Is that correct? How about if it's that kind of enormous power? How about the voltage that someone might pick up by touching their car? It's metal. Yeah, the, the, the rule is the longer we measure these threats in volts per meter. But I've seen enormous numbers even in per meter. Uh, uh, one meter is nothing. One meter is not... But there's still voltages I've seen mentioned, thousands of volts per meter. So if a, if a meter can generate thousands of volts, so what would this translate to, to an individual who might be handling some you know, a piece of metal, piece of wire. A you might have a brief remember, remember, also remember this, this is a, a width of these pulses are measured in billionths of a second. Okay. So you, you might have some sensation, but there probably would not be enough energy. So people are not going to be getting electrocuted from this. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're touching one of these long ones, uh, all that's wrong. How about a fence? How, how big does it have to be before you're going to see interaction um, if the fence is not well grounded, uh, you're going to get it. Huh. Okay. Thank you. 
uh, and with integrated circuits. And uh, in fact, your students and others at Frostburg had done some uh, somewhat related testing, taking a taser to uh, a wire and see what would happen to the computer plugged in. What, what happened in that case, and what's the tie-in between the two? Yeah, we had a. I had a student project where they. Uh, I got. I got a whole, just a whole raft of surplus computers from our computer science department at James Madison University, and uh, and we tased them, and uh, we you know, we were able to burn out the. the uh, it was it was interesting. Uh, another misconception is EMP probably is going to interfere with the, the signal line uh, electronics more than the power electronics with the tasers uh, direct injecting the, the computers it was the power supplies that m most often burned out uh, so that was, was a an unexpected uh, result uh, sir uh, mass sergeant john huddleston uh, critical infrastructure protection uh, i may have missed it but uh, your second one emp will burn out uh, every exposed electronic systems did, did i miss that one? and uh, I, I didn't. I didn't see it, but I didn't know if we were going to talk about it later. But I'm interested in that one, and that was in your lead-in, so you're, yeah. that you were going to talk about it later. That's right. I think that somehow this uh, skipped that chart, and I'm not. I'm just. This thing seems to be locked up at present. I know several uh, questions have been asked about. This. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, it turns out that systems that are smaller, self-contained, have their own internal power supplies. Oftentimes, when we did threat level testing. You know, Military systems, the systems would, did not fail. In fact, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a tactical radio system. I remember we tested up to 400,000 volts per meter, and the system, it, the system didn't fail. No, no effect. However, when we take the same radio, the same radio systems that that when they were buttoned up uh, with, and just attached to a short whip antenna, and we started connecting them into radio wire integration networks, connecting them to a, a field wire and long lines, those same systems failed. And so, but, but the message is, the longer the line, uh, the, uh, the more, system, just as a rule of thumb, the more vulnerable systems are. Uh, so there are, but there are many systems. Um, uh, I suspect that your cell phone, you know, just the, the cell phone, the little cell phone itself, probably would not fail in, a, uh, in, to, in an EMP environment. But what will fail is the supporting network, the long line network that supports that. Uh, Phil Milmester, ICF, great presentation. Uh, on the ground burst slide, which you happen to have up, so, so um, you know, uh, 20 kilometers, in your estimate, how, would the ca how far further out would cascading effects on the grid propagate? Because you would have an instantaneous loss of load. Uh, would it start tripping, you know, and, 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 and cascade out to a much wider uh, area? I think, uh, you know, for, uh, maybe not for a 10 kiloton, but a, you know, 100 kiloton uh, burst in the hundreds of kilotons, probably, I would guess, you might have effects out to 40 or 50 miles from the burst. Yeah. Now, there's, there's more analysis that needs to be done. A lot of it depends upon the grid, grid structure, the fan out, you know, because the, the current, the, uh, what happens is the, uh, when the burst goes off, it, it charges up the atmosphere, and then the, the, uh, the electrons in the atmosphere tend to return to the burst through the wires. So a lot of it depends on how many wires are out there, uh, but there's, it, it's not an easy problem to solve. There's a, uh, we need to do some uh, uh, you know, network modeling uh, there. Uh, last question. Going once, going twice. Well, let's hear a great thank you for Dr. George Baker. <laughs>